I don't know you very well, but I suspect you open your bananas from the wrong end. The reason for that supposition is that virtually everybody who grows up in the temperate zone does open them from the wrong end. I know I did until last week. I raise the point because I think it tells us something interesting about humanity. We think of ourselves as intelligent, creative, skeptical, and we often are. But it is also possible for us to take cultural information, for example, which end to open the banana, and to accept it, and to go a full lifetime never questioning whether it might be easier, whether we might be holding it the wrong way up. And I think climate change is a bit like this. Were we able to peer into our various possible futures, I think we would come to recognize the trajectory we're on as much more frightening than we know, and the possibility of retooling society as much more enticing, much more interesting, the possibility to live through something like an enlightenment. I'm an evolutionary theorist. What I do and what I'm going to do here is provide something akin to a map. At the end, you should be able to read four things on that map. The first is where we are. The second is where we will end up if we do nothing. The third is where we should be headed. And the fourth is the minimum conditions necessary to change in order to get on that trajectory. Now, I'm sure I've raised some questions amongst many of you. Why is an evolutionary theorist talking about climate change? It's not as if the climate evolves in the Darwinian sense, and that's true. But I'm going to argue that climate change is not really a problem. It's more a symptom of a problem, a problem that caused the financial collapse of 2008, caused the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf in 2010, and the ongoing Fukushima disaster starting in March of 2011. If we don't understand the connection between these events, then we are liable to reach for the wrong solutions. At best, those solutions will be ineffective. At worst, they may even be harmful. Now, my contention that evolution has something to do with this puzzle involves the claim that there is cultural evolution affecting markets, which is in and of itself not a particularly radical argument. There is, after all, a fledgling field called evolutionary economics that proceeds roughly from that premise. But those uh, attempts to map evolutionary theory onto economics tend to proceed from the economic side, and they often miss something about the Darwinian subtleties that might be included if they came from the biological side. So the most important thing we can do here today is get the mapping correct so that we can understand the implications. There are four necessary and sufficient conditions to produce adaptive evolution of the Darwinian type. They are hierarchical. Each one depends on the ones above. They are reproduction, variation between the products of reproduction, heritability of those variants, and differential success amongst them. Any system that has those things will adaptively evolve, whether it is algorithms in, in a virtual environment or whether it is rabbits on a prairie. So the question is, how can those things function in the economic context? The temptation is to imagine that agents within the market, people or companies, evolve within the ecosystem that is provided by the market. And I, I see two failures there. The first is that those agents, companies and individuals, don't really reproduce. And that calls into question all four of these criteria. I would argue instead that we should look at strategies evolving culturally within the market. Do strategies really reproduce? They do. Um, let me give you an example. The Xerox Corporation innovated a graphical user interface driven by mouse. The Apple Corporation adopted that and enhanced it. They built up the metaphor and made it more useful. The Microsoft Corporation took Apple's graphical user interface and they broadened it by making it run on uh, a wider variety of machines. So you have reproduction, heritable variation, and differential success. And in that context, we could imagine that the ecosystem in which those strategies used by agents evolve is the market. But what we need to understand in order to see this puzzle is that the boundaries of the evolutionary environment do not stop at the market's edge. What do we make of the company that innovates a strategy of persuading the legislature to give up a subsidy for some sort of activity? Now, if that activity is useless or harmful, we may find that activity anathema, but from a Darwinian perspective, it's every bit as much a strategy as the graphical user interface. So my contention is strategies evolve within markets and their larger regulatory uh, context. 
In the story I've told you with the graphical user interface, we see a classic tale of enhanced utility, where the pie grows as the result of some sort of an insight. And that's a very positive thing. That is what is classically imagined to produce profits in a market. There are many examples. Here we have the first step on the road that eventually led to the modern bicycle. This is the dandy horse of 1817. It's uh, originally imagined as an aid to walking, and it's practically useless. <laughs> This is the uncomfortable and difficult to control bone shaker of 1869. This is the useful but very dangerous penny farthing. <laughs> and finally, in 1885, we get the emergence of the safety bicycle, and it is fantastic. It is so fantastic, in fact, that it is the reason that the gay 1890s are gay. This machine allows people to travel five times as far, five times as fast under their, only, or under their own power. It is the horseless horse. So when we look at this thing, we can see the classic trajectory of insight after insight built up in the bicycle. And we can say, oh, that's how the market is supposed to work. That's how these strategies are supposed to evolve. But we can also recognize in the bicycle industry some other patterns. The bicycle industry causes itself a problem almost immediately with the safety bicycle, which is that once you know how to organize the parts, once you know what the shape of the frame is supposed to be, it becomes relatively easy to produce a machine that is durable, very useful, cheap, and lasts forever. So even when bicycling becomes very popular, the bicycle industry can be kind of sleepy. So the bicycle industry has had many innovations since 1885. Many of them are important. But it's also had long periods of the doldrums, when it had to monkey around with gimmicks to sell people things they didn't really need in order to keep itself alive. Um, in the last 20 years, it has begun monkeying around with replacing the steel bicycle frame with materials that are extremely expensive and very fragile, thus creating something like a disposable bicycle. Um, this might be funny if it didn't produce uh, very serious impacts. Every so often, one of these bicycles falls apart when somebody is riding it at high speed, and that's obviously a severe danger. So this is not a case of uh, an increase in utility, a gain on the size of the pie. It's the opposite case. It's the case of a decrease in the size of a pie, where individuals may have their slice grow, but at some cost to us all. This is what all of our environmental problems look like. They look like somebody making a profit for degrading what belongs to the rest of us. It's quite clear that this behavior should not be allowed within a marketplace. We are fracturing the world. We are liquidating it. We are draining it. We are denuding it. We are overexploiting it. It is apparent to anyone who looks at what we're up to. The idea that this should not be allowed is transparent. My eight-year-old son gets it immediately. My six-year-old son gets it in a matter of a minute or two. My cat is still stuck on the idea that harm is a bad thing, but that's on him. <laughs> <clears throat> Nonetheless, we have to ask ourselves what fraction of the economic activity that surrounds us is profitable only by virtue of the fact that those who make the money are externalizing the cost to somebody else. Um, if we were to eliminate such behaviors, we would presumably reduce the amount of activity a lot, which frightens people. But we would reduce it by exactly the fraction of activities that shouldn't have existed in the first place. There's also some question as to how we should feel about when a corporation does something like this. Our initial instinct as human beings is to be incensed, incensed that somebody has delivered a cost to somebody else that didn't naturally belong to them. But I would argue that's something of a mistake. The agents in the market are responding to opportunities that we have left open. Uh, it makes no more sense to be angry at them for exploiting profitable opportunities than it does to be angry at the mosquito for sucking your blood. The opportunity is there, and if you don't want the mosquito to suck your blood, you have to close down the opportunity. So let's look at a thought experiment about how evolution of strategies in markets would function. On the left, you have a benevolent corporation. It does only what's in the public's interest. In the middle, you have a ruthless corporation that does only what's in its own interest, irrespective of the cost of society. And on the right, you have a corporation that's more realistic. It's a mixed strategy. There are some costs it will inflict on the public. There are some costs that go too far. And it tries to balance those concerns. Now imagine that these companies face a series of choices across a year. Occasionally, those choices will make what's good for society exactly the same as what is good for the company, in which case what we get is 
No competitive advantage. They're dead even in competition. But most choices aren't going to look like that. There will be equally rare ones in which what's good for society is exactly the opposite of what is good for the company, in which case only the ruthless corporation can profit from the opportunity. But the common case will be somewhere in between. And in this case, we see why evolution in the market is producing some of the phenomena we're experiencing. In the case that the, what is good for the company is somewhat different from what is good for society, the ruthless corporation has the greatest advantage. Why? Because it can do anything it wants. And the corporation that is bound by what's good for society can't do anything. The corporation that tries to balance these concerns finds that it competes best with the ruthless corporation the more ruthless it becomes. And the outcome is predictable. <laughs> In the end, in sectors of our economy where there is not a lot of room for utility increasing innovations, we see an evolution towards ruthlessness that has predictable consequences. <clears throat> and that has interacted with what I will claim is the central flaw in our system. And when I say system, I mean our global system with the, with the US at its head. What we have here are feedback loops that interact. Wealth that is made in the market is capable of increasing one's power over regulation. Power over regulation allows increased opportunity to make money in the market. This is a positive feedback loop. That should scare any engineer or biologist because positive feedback loops that are not bounded by some negative feedback force are unstable. They detonate, they explode. In our case, this feedback loop has re-engineered our system cryptically and turned it into an engine for the concentration of wealth and power. And it has installed, amongst an unelected group of very powerful and wealthy people, effective veto power over any attempt to change from the status quo. So many people, I know from experience, can accept this logic when it comes to corporations. What happens, though, when you try to explain that this logic actually is not sensitive to scale, that it applies equally to nations, and even more troublingly to people, is that the mind wants to rebel. It doesn't want to believe it. But my contention is the same force is at work for us as individuals. That when people hear about climate change and the harms that it, it does, they very naturally want to do something. They want to limit their contribution to that danger. They want to restrain their own behavior, reduce their carbon footprint. But paradoxically, the individual in the market, uh, by, re by spending more for more responsible products, is actually reducing their influence on the system and causing the system to evolve more quickly in the direction of ruthlessness. Now, there, I call this the personal responsibility vortex. It sucks good people in. And it has two logical consequences. The first is, that we should redirect any effort that we are tempted to spend on personal responsibility towards collective action, towards collective action that can restructure the incentives that surround the market so that we actually have a chance of altering the behavior. The second logical consequence is that there are two types of systems that we can have. One type of system, the costs of sustaining the system go to the benevolent. That system will inevitably evolve towards ruthlessness and instability. The converse system, though, one where the costs of maintaining society go to the ruthless, evolves towards benevolence and stability. Whenever policy is in question, we should ask ourselves, does the policy lead in the direction of the one type or the other? If we want to rescue our system, we're going to have to do some radical things. The first thing we need to do is we need to place a firewall that is impermeable between the marketplace and the regulatory apparatus. It is no problem that people make money in the marketplace. There is nothing wrong when someone creates utility, them being rewarded for it. The problem is when that reward begins to generate its own rewards, positive feedback sets in. The second thing we have to do is we have to rethink the way we keep track of behavior in the marketplace. We need full cost accounting, which means that every cost that is generated by an activity in the market needs to show up on the balance sheet whether that is borrowing from future generations, whether it is putting the population at risk. Whatever the costs of an activity are, be they military or otherwise, they need to be included in the price of the product or otherwise returned to those who decided to initiate the action. If we did that, 
the amount of economic ap activity would drop, but it would drop to exactly those behaviors that are actually beneficial to society, leaving out all of those externalities that are generating so much profit with our current system. Now, I began this by saying that I thought we would think very differently about climate change if we could look at our possible futures. I also have a similar sense about the past. The sense is, if we could show the people who architected our system the way the system would come apart in the end, they might have protected us better. The Founding Fathers never saw a bicycle. They probably couldn't have imagined a chainsaw. They certainly could not have foreseen high-line logging, mountaintop removal mining. They couldn't have imagined deep ocean drilling. If they had been able to see those things, my guess is sustainability would have been at the top of their list of concerns. I'm thinking it might even have ended up as our First Amendment and the Bill of Rights. How cool would it be if our Bill of Rights went to 11? <laughs> no, really, how cool would it be if our Bill of Rights went to 11? Yes, I think they would have been very focused on sustainability and reversibility. Unfortunately, there is no mechanism to deliver them the map. <laughs>